Hello. Although it's an extremely important field method, and it's critical to landscape archaeology, archaeological survey is far from perfect. We should never expect even highly skilled surveyors to find everything that's available to be found. And consequently, it's really important to consider the factors that affect the results of surveys and to evaluate surveys after they're done in order to assess their completeness, their thoroughness, their quality overall, and to assure the consumers of data from those surveys that those data are reliable and valid. In this video, I'd like to review some of the factors that affect survey and how we can address those factors in the planning and evaluation of surveys. Some of the factors that affect archaeological survey, theoretically at least, are either entirely or partially under our own control. For example, we select the size and composition of the field team, and we can try to make sure that that team has the right combination of skills and experience. On the other hand, we're also constrained by some kind of budget, and the pool of potential field team members is likely to be quite limited. Similarly, for the other factors listed here, there may be some latitude in our choices, but also some restrictions in such things as available equipment and government regulations. Some other factors are largely outside our control. For example, the only control we have over visibility is to time our survey for a season when there is not too much obscuring vegetation. Some of these factors have to do with the characteristics of the targets, that is, the archaeological artifacts or sites that we're trying to find. Those are, of course, completely outside our control, and all we can do is try to anticipate what they might be like. Clearly, one of the factors under our control is the choice of survey method. Each method has its own advantages and disadvantages. Geophysical methods like ground penetrating radar, for example, work well in situations where we have good reason to believe that there are large buried features, such as ditches and stone walls. But in some other situations, they might not be very effective, or they might be just too costly. In fact, these methods are usually used within known sites, instead of to find sites. Even methods like shovel testing and coring and augering have to be used sparingly because of their relatively high cost. Consequently, they tend to be used only when issues of visibility prevent us from using field walking as our field method. And in most parts of the world, field walking remains the most common method for archaeological survey. As I mentioned in my introductory video on archaeological survey, visibility has to do with factors that impede our ability to detect things. These are mostly environmental variables, such as vegetation cover and lighting conditions. But they also depend on detection method. For example, Vegetation and overlying sediment impede our ability to detect artifacts visually, but they're completely transparent to radar. Sometimes, especially in hot climates, the survey day begins when the sun is low and the lighting is very dim. Early in the day, the sun also casts long shadows that can sometimes interfere with our ability to identify things on the ground. Later still in the day, there can be extreme glare from the sun. All these variations in sunlight have an impact on our ability to detect artifacts visually. Overlying sediment is a particular problem for survey by visual inspection, but sometimes we get a glimpse of what lies beneath from construction cuts, gullies, or as in this case, tomb robbing activity. Some impacts on survey results depend on the characteristics of the target, whether that be a site or an artifact. One important aspect of target characteristics is one that archaeologists conventionally call obtrusiveness. This has to do with how much the target of interest, whether that's an artifact or a site, stands out from its environment. It also depends on detection method. For example, when we're using visual detection in field walking, a Near Eastern tell site or a monument with standing stones stands out much better than a shirt scatter or a lithic scatter. Some kinds of artifacts don't differ much in their color from their surroundings, but they have unusual shapes. For example, they may be more elongated or more pointed than most of the pebbles in their surroundings. However, even artifacts with fairly complex shapes can be less than obvious. In some cases, they may also be more reflective or have unnatural looking patterning on their surfaces. In addition, a lithic scatter on a sandy beach 
stands out much more than a lithic scatter on a flint regasol, where it's hard to distinguish flint artifacts from the natural flint pebbles that surround them. Meanwhile, if we used magnetometry as our survey method, an iron cannonball would be much more obtrusive than would a buried ditch or pit, because the cannonball has so much more iron in it than the surrounding soils do, while the iron content of the buried pit or ditch might only vary slightly from that of the surrounding sediments. Consequently, although we tend to think of obtrusiveness as a characteristic inherent in the target, the artifact, or the site, really it has to do with contrast between those characteristics and those of the environment. False targets are objects that we mistake for the target of interest. For a visual survey, they could be little bits of garbage, or fallen leaves, or even feathers that are shaped a little bit like artifacts. In aerial or satellite survey, false targets are things that we misidentify in the imagery. And in geophysical survey, false targets are often natural features that could be mistaken for archaeological ones, such as a large buried boulder. The main problem with false targets is that they constitute a cost because we have to waste time investigating them. Another target characteristic that we have to consider for some kinds of targets, such as sites, is their shape and orientation. Some kinds of targets, notably ancient roads or the spoil banks of ancient canals, are extremely elongated. And we can take advantage of this characteristic when we design a survey to find them. I'll talk more about this aspect later in the video. For some types of survey, we need to select the size and shape of our observation unit. Coring and augering, for example, involve small, circular observation units. Shovel testing and test pitting often involve ones that are at least nominally square. Although test pitting can also involve more elongated rectangles or even trenches. Field walking typically involves transects, which we often conceptualize as elongated rectangles. However, survey projects often cluster these transects within some kind of sampling unit, which is often a square but can be a more irregular shape. The size and arrangement of observation units has a substantial impact on the probability of discovering certain kinds of targets. I'll talk more about this in the context of edge effects later in the video. The search patterns we use while carrying out a survey can also have a substantial impact on the results. Typically those involve either some arrangement of transects or some arrangement of points on a grid. The size, shape, spacing, and orientation of these observation units can interact with the characteristics of the targets we're trying to find. As mentioned in my introductory video on survey, one of the most common patterns for field walking is parallel transects. Although some surveys use meandering transects with the idea of altering the direction from which surveyors look at the ground, and some surveys can involve a second set of transects at an angle to the first. In appropriate circumstances, we could also employ expanding square search or transects that radiate out from the perimeter of a known site. We also have lots of options for subsurface survey even though a square grid is the one most commonly used. Some of the main options include an offset grid and an equilateral triangular grid. These same grid options are also potentially useful for chemical survey, magnetometry, and resistivity survey. One really important aspect of the interaction between search pattern and the characteristics of the target we're looking for is called edge effects. The shape of the search unit is one of the most important contributors to this effect. Transects are effectively long, narrow rectangles, and they have a very high ratio of perimeter to their area. Consequently, there's a relatively high probability that any site that comes near the transect will intersect the edge of it. By contrast, a more compact observation unit, such as a circle or square, has a relatively low perimeter to area ratio. This makes it less likely that they will intersect a site of a given size, whenever that site is small relative to the spacing between observations. For example, when a site is large relative to the transect spacing, no matter what the site's shape, it's guaranteed that the transects will intersect the site at least once, and the probability of detecting the site is relatively high. 
By contrast, when sites are unobtrusive and relatively small, such as small, roughly circular, shirred or lithic scatters, some sites could occur between the transects and not be intersected at all, while others fall partly within the transect areas and might be detected even though their centers lie outside the transect area. Since we usually can't assume that sites are circular, other factors to consider are the shape and orientation of the sites. Often sites are elongated, and if they have a preferred orientation, that can have an impact on our likelihood of intersecting them with transects. When the transects are diagonal to the preferred orientation of the sites, we have a greater chance of intersecting them. And when they're perpendicular to that preferred orientation, the probability of intersecting them is higher still. By contrast, if our transects are parallel to the main axis of the sites, then the probability of intersection is dramatically lower. Consequently, whenever we have some grounds for predicting the orientation of sites, we should take advantage of it. For example, in certain kinds of topography, we might have reason to believe that the sites will be oriented along ridge tops, while in some other areas, we might have reason to believe that sites extend along the sides of rivers. However, in a lot of instances, either the sites will not have a preferred orientation, or we simply won't have any idea what that orientation might be. In that situation, it might not matter that much how we orient our transects. There are similar factors to consider in the case of subsurface survey. In the case of shovel testing, for example, larger shovel tests, or shovel tests that are closer together in space, are more likely to intersect a site of a given size. And when the targets are sites, the shape and preferred orientation of sites could also be a factor. When our targets are artifacts, either for their own sake or as a way of finding sites, the density of artifacts and whether or not the artifacts are clustered or more evenly spread out are major factors. In fact, if we have some basis for estimating the density of artifacts in an area we're about to survey, we can use this information to optimize the size and spacing of our shovel tests. In that event, one option is to assume that the artifacts are randomly distributed within the space, in which case we can use the Poisson distribution as a guide. The Poisson distribution is a model for the distribution of random events in space or time. If, for example, we had reason to believe that the density of artifacts on a site in our region would be around three artifacts per square meter, it's pretty easy to figure out how big our shovel tests should be, or how closely spaced they should be, to make it reasonably probable that we'll find at least some artifacts should some of our shovel tests intersect a site. On the other hand, it's fairly likely that the artifacts on a site will not be randomly distributed, and instead will be clustered in some way. The more clustered the artifacts are, the more likely it is that many of the shovel tests will intersect empty space even when they're on a site. Consequently, we may have to anticipate this by using larger or more closely spaced shovel tests than we would have predicted with the Poisson model. Another possible approach to this problem is to use adaptive cluster sampling. This depends on the concept of a neighborhood. For example, on a square grid, we could define the neighborhood of the red square as being the eight white squares that surround it. On an equilateral triangular grid, the neighborhood of the red square would be the six blue squares. In its application to subsurface survey, such as shovel testing, adaptive cluster sampling involves adding additional shovel tests in the neighborhood of any positive ones, with positive being defined as containing an artifact or a particular kind of artifact. For the purposes of this demonstration, I've exaggerated the sizes of the shovel tests just to make it easier to see. If the red square represents a positive test pit, or shovel test, we would then dig additional shovel tests in its neighborhood. If some of them also turned out to be positive, we'd have to add additional shovel tests in their neighborhoods. And if some of those also turn out to be positive, we have to add still more. And the process continues until none of the added shovel tests yield any artifacts. We might then conclude that the area occupied by the red squares constitutes a site. I plan to discuss adaptive cluster sampling in more detail in a future video. 
Intensity is the conventional name for the amount of search effort that archaeologists invest per area surveyed. Typically, they measure this by the spacing between surveyors, or the spacing between observations by shovel tests or geophysical survey. The smaller the spacing, the greater the intensity. However, we could also measure it in terms of search time, with units like person hours per hectare. In search theory, the term that's equivalent to intensity is density of effort. A more useful term for describing effort is coverage. It's simply the total area swept by field walking and similar transect-based methods, or the total area of all shovel tests, auger holes, or similar point-based observations, divided by the total area of the surveyed region. It doesn't depend on the shape or orientation or arrangement of the survey units, but only on their area. So as long as we have a good basis for estimating that area, either by having realistic measurements of the total area of all test pits, for example, or realistic estimates of sweep width in field walking, coverage becomes our best estimate of effort. The detectors we use in an archaeological survey all vary in their capabilities. In the case of resistivity survey, for example, we can vary the range with depth by changing the distance between the electrodes that are put in the ground. Some kinds of detectors give us continuous or nearly continuous readings along a transect, as in the case of electromagnetic survey seen here, or ground penetrating radar. Other detectors involve making measurements at discrete points along a transect, often on some kind of grid. This would normally be true of magnetometry and certainly resistivity survey. And while most survey methods give us immediate results in the field, there are some, like chemical survey, that might require post-field season analysis. For field walking, shovel testing, and a number of other survey methods, our detectors are actually human beings. And of course, we should expect people to vary in their effectiveness at doing survey. For any type of survey that involves visual detection of artifacts and features, vision is one of the most obvious variations among surveyors. Whether they are near or far-sighted, wearing glasses or sunglasses, or walking towards the sun will have obvious impacts on their ability to detect things. Just like any other kind of detector, human surveyors vary in their effectiveness. Some are really good at finding pottery, but don't know enough about the lithics to identify them consistently. Others may be excellent detectors of lithics, but not very good at finding coins or beads. For this and other reasons, it's a good idea to have a survey team that has a mix of expertise, and to train surveyors in the identification of the kinds of artifacts you'd expect to find on the survey. Survey is usually quite hard work, under conditions ranging from light drizzle to blistering heat and glaring sun. Digging many test pits, or walking for several kilometers in rough terrain, is really tiring, and fatigue takes its toll on surveyors' effectiveness. Consequently, it's essential to have regular rest stops, with shelter if possible. A very useful strategy, especially in mountainous terrain, is to have surveyors dropped off at the upper end of some transects at the beginning of the day, and then picked up by vehicle at the end of the transects at the end of the day. This saves the surveyors from having to trudge uphill to the truck at a time when they're at their most tired. However, it also requires careful timing or coordination, or at least communication with the driver by cell phone. Not surprisingly, for most kinds of survey, the probability of detecting things declines with the speed of survey. Consequently, field walkers should move at a slow and steady pace, allowing them time to scan the ground. Surveyors are likely to be much more effective when they feel they have some stake in the results of the survey. In addition, they're not likely to be very effective at all if they are unhappy or disgruntled employees. Team morale is consequently very important. Sometimes a surveyor's attention might not be fully on the job at hand. Surveyors can be distracted by interesting animals or dangerous ones, or by interesting scenery or rock formations. They can be preoccupied with what they're going to do to relax after the day is done, and might be thinking about getting back to the car as quickly as possible. One study found that surveyors who were much less likely to find sites on Fridays 
when they were probably preoccupied with their weekend plans. As it turns out, we can summarize many of these factors simultaneously in a mathematical formula. These are called detection functions, and one detection function describes the relationship between search effort and probability of detection. In this slide, for example, we measure search time by the number of minutes of search applied to a particular area. And there are three different curves for three different search areas called grid 1, 2, and 3. For all three grids, notice how the relationship is not linear. The detection rate is quite steep in the first few minutes of search, but then it levels off. In fact, after about 15 minutes of search, there's not much point in searching further, as that would yield hardly any new detections. The nonlinearity results from a number of reasons, including that the number of targets available is finite, and that we're likely to make the easiest detections first. For example, we're likely to find the largest and most obtrusive artifacts in the first few minutes of search. Once we've searched long enough to reach that plateau, it really makes more sense to search elsewhere where we'd be in the steeper part of the curve. There are also detection functions to represent the relationship between the probability of detection and the distance between the observer and the target. The one you see here is a model called the definite detection model. It's the simplest and least realistic model, as it represents the assumption that surveyors will find all the artifacts within a certain distance of their transect, and none at all outside that distance. The sum of those distances to left and right of the transect is represented here by W, which means the sweep width. Although this model is extremely unrealistic, it is still inherent in a lot of archaeological work today. Any survey project that assumes that field walkers are finding all of the artifacts within a certain distance of their transects is implicitly using this model. Another model, called the inverse cube detection model, is fairly realistic at describing the relationship between discovery probability and range for various kinds of geophysical survey methods. But it can also be applied to visual searches where the probability of detection within a certain range is fairly close to 1. Like the definite detection model, this model has assured detection within a certain range, but outside that range, the probability of detection declines as the inverse of the cube of the range. For example, at twice the range, the probability of detection is one-eighth. A more realistic model for some kinds of archaeological survey, including field walking, is the exponential model. According to this model, Detection could be imperfect even at a range of zero meters. And probability of detection declines exponentially with distance away from the transect, the result looking a little bit like a normal distribution. For this model, the sweep width w corresponds to the region of the curve where the number of undetected artifacts within w, as represented by the black area above the curve, is equal to the number of detected artifacts outside w as represented by the black areas in the tails of the curve. Another way to look at this is in map view. If a field walker walks along the dash line on this map, she might find all of the artifacts indicated as red circles, and fail to detect all the artifacts indicated as white circles. Notice that the number of red circles outside of W is equal to the number of white circles within W. Consequently, the effective sweep width W defines the range within which the surveyor finds the same number of artifacts she would have found under the definite detection model. Here we see these three models compared, and for many survey types, the exponential model will be the most realistic one. The steepness of falloff in the exponential function will depend on a variety of factors, including what type of target we're talking about, visibility, and how effective the surveyor is. In the example shown here, a very obtrusive kind of pottery called blue transfer ware has almost 80% chance of discovery at a range of 2.5 meters. At that same distance, we'd only expect to find about 55% of glass artifacts and about 35% of tokens, which in this case were copper discs about the size of an American quarter. But we'd only expect to find about 5% of the small nails. In this case, the artifacts were distributed on a plowed field with relatively good visibility. And the detection functions would have been steeper if the visibility were worse. 
The detection functions for range also have implications for the detection functions for effort. If the definite detection model were realistic, it would mean that gradually increasing coverage would result in a linear increase in the probability of detection until we reached 100%. By contrast, both the inverse cube and the exponential model have nonlinear relationships with detection probability. But the plateau for the inverse cube model is higher than the plateau for the exponential one. The exponential model also applies to random search, meaning a survey by random walk. However, for most kinds of survey, the only way for us to determine the detection functions is by experiment. For example, by calibrating our field crews on fields that we have sown with artifacts in known locations. Here, for example, we've stretched a measuring tape down the middle of a plowed olive grove and planted artifacts in known locations to left and right of the tape. We arrange the artifacts so that there are equal numbers of each type of artifact at different ranges away from the tape, but they are randomly distributed with distance along the field. Each member of the team takes turns walking along the tape and recording the artifacts that they can see on an iPad. Each time they see an artifact, they estimate how far away it is from the tape, as well as recording the distance along the tape. Later, we take the data accumulated on the iPads and use it to calculate the detection functions for this particular field. We can then use those detection functions to estimate the sweep widths for various kinds of artifacts on fields similar to this and surveyed by the same team. We have to repeat this process on other fields with different visibility characteristics in order to calculate the sweep widths for those kinds of fields. Almost as important as the design of a survey is post-survey evaluation. We'll want to know whether or not the survey achieved its objectives. For the sampling type of survey, that includes checking on whether or not the sample size is adequate. And if we were sampling for sites, you might want to assess whether or not the survey appears to have captured all levels of a site hierarchy or a settlement system. When it seems likely that the sample has overlooked large or rare sites, it's not uncommon to supplement it with some purpose of survey. For example, in the histograms shown here, the sample survey was very successful at finding a lot of small sites and medium-sized sites. The purpose of survey that supplemented it was able to find several large sites. However, in this situation, it's important to resist the temptation to lump the purpose of sites together with the sample sites, as that would yield biased estimates of the population characteristics. All we can really infer about those purpose of sites is that they were too rare to appear in the sample of a given size. This allows us to establish something like detection limits on their frequency. For surveys that employed stratified sampling, an important thing to evaluate is the success of the stratification. If you selected a good basis for stratification, then there should be statistically significant differences among the strata in relevant attributes. If there are no differences among the strata, the implication is that the stratification was pointless. A very important aspect of post-survey evaluation is to assess the thoroughness of survey and to report as accurately as possible the coverage of different parts of the survey region. This allows the consumers of archaeological survey reports to assess whether or not the absence of archaeological materials in particular places is due to real absences or just low intensity of survey. We can show this information with coverage maps, sometimes called exhaustion maps, because the areas that have experienced the most survey are exhausted in the sense that further survey is unlikely to yield any additional archaeological resources. That's because search in those areas has reached the plateau in the search effort curve. You can find the topics I've just introduced described in more detail in my book, Archaeological Survey, published by Springer. And if you'd like to be notified when I release new videos on survey or other topics, please click on the subscribe button down below. Thank you and stay safe.